We're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. How's everybody doing today? Pretty good. good? All right. You sound good. I want to make sure you're warmed up. You're ready. I'd like to start off with a little congregational participation here at the beginning of my message. So clear your mind. All right. And when you think of an answer, I want you to just call it out. You don't have to raise a hand. Just shout it out. I'd like you to finish this sentence. All right. I believe... And God the Father Almighty. Yep, that's a, I wonder where you heard that. All right, anything else? Think, there's, there's lots of ways to answer or things that people say. I believe. I believe in miracles. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop it right there. Good one. Yeah, what, any, any others? We sang some earlier today. I believe you're my healer. You are all I need. All right. <laughs> Amen. 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 Uh, anything else? I believe in gravity. I believe he's my savior. Amen. That's a good one. I believe in God. I'm, there, when I was doing this, I came up with a bunch of other like secular songs. I don't know. I, I'm, there, that's the one I was looking for. I believe I can touch the sky. All right. Good. Okay. You sound like you're all warmed up. Good. Welcome to Redemption Church. My name is Marshall Blessing. I'm the care pastor here, and I'm glad to have fellowship with you all today. This is our third week discussing the Apostles' Creed. If you missed either of the previous sermons, I encourage you to go onto our website and check them out. They're, they were great. They're pretty awesome. So they're posted on our website. You can share those with others who might have missed them. A creed is a formal statement of beliefs. It is a set of beliefs or aims that guide someone's actions. So the Apostles' Creed, it doesn't tell us what we believe. You can't really be issued a set of beliefs, all right? Here's, here it is, the Apostles' Creed, you believe this now. You have, this is, these are your beliefs. No, you, you have to decide what you believe. That's right. The Apostles' Creed summarizes some common Christian beliefs. The Creed can help remind us of some of the core beliefs of Christianity. And if you hold these beliefs, then reciting the Creed allows us to affirm the beliefs that we share with our brothers and sisters in Christ. All right? But it's important that we understand what the creed is saying. That's why we're talking about it over these weeks. If you have questions about the creed or about what it means or what it says, feel free to contact us. We'd love to talk to you about it. In fact, you can use our anonymous text line, 214-856-0550. We welcome your questions. We love talking about Jesus, and, and we want to help each other understand. So if you have a question, don't keep it to yourself. Reach out. 
as we read through the creed together, if there is a part that you don't understand or you're not sure you agree with, then feel free to not read that part. That's okay. But let's take a minute and read through the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you very much. If you could, leave that last part up there for just a second. I was going to talk about this later, but I'd like to address it right now. We've been going through the creed for three weeks. I don't know how closely you were paying attention, but every time we've shown it, there's this asterisk right there. And we've never talked about it. It's just sort of there. So I'm, I'm going to remedy that right now. That asterisk has a meaning. It means that that word is to be read with an upward inflection. The Holy Catholic Church? No, just kidding. That's, a, a lot of times that's how it gets read. But no, that, what that asterisk means is that we're not affirming our belief in the Roman Catholic Church. Here, the word Catholic means all-embracing, universal. So when we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, we're saying, I believe in the universal Christian church. Yes. Is that something you can get behind? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Amen. That, that's, it's something good. We're all part of that universal church. Yes, we are. Thank you, sir. Praise God. So that's what that means. If you've been wondering, boom, you don't have to send that text. We got that one covered. All right. I am very excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about the Apostles' Creed today because it's been a part of my faith since I was very young. As Chris mentioned in the first week of this series, the members of this church come from a wide variety of denominational backgrounds. Some of us may have grown up in or mainly attended a church that rarely, if ever, recited the Apostles' Creed. That's okay. That's how some churches do it. Before this sermon series... I don't really remember us reading through the Apostles' Creed in service here at Redemption Church. That's okay. I come from a Presbyterian background. I was raised in a church that reads the Apostles' Creed every Sunday. I had the Apostles' Creed memorized before I fully understood everything that it says. And that's why I'm glad that we're talking about it now so that I can finally find out what these things I've been saying all these years. No, that's not true. Uh, it, I grew up in a church that said the Apostles' Creed. And so it's been a part of my life for a long time. It's, in fact, it's kind of near and dear to my heart because of a man back at that church I grew up in named Don Griffith. He was the head usher at the First Presbyterian Church of Pensacola for many years. He was a very sweet man. And one Sunday, I, this was so far back I barely even remember it, uh, I was sitting with my parents and he kind of got my attention in the middle of service and said, hey, can you come give me a hand? Can you help me out? And so I followed him back to the back of the church. And what he would do is he would get kids in the congregation to help him out with some of the usher duties just to get them involved and give them something to do. And so he let me carry the plates back up to the front after collection, after the offering. And that's just the kind of 
guy he was. He, he cared about kids. He was a very nice guy, and he wanted to get the youth involved in church. They were a part of church. He wanted them to feel like it. Well, in addition to being the head usher, he also worked for many years at the local radio station there in Pensacola. He was uh, a voice on the radio, and man, did he ever have a voice. He had a beautiful voice. I mean, if that's not a funny thing to say about a guy, he, he had a radio voice. And I would help with some of the usher duties week after week because there weren't that many kids that went to the early service. And so I would often be back at the back of the church with him when they read through the Apostles' Creed. And so I would hear him say the Apostles' Creed with his radio voice. And man, it really like got to you, you know? Hearing him say it made me want to say it. That's how I came to memorize it. I didn't even, I wasn't consciously trying. I was just reading along with him and with his wonderful voice. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I, I, don't, I can't even imitate it. But it, it warms my heart to think about him, and I think about him when we recite the creed. Through the years, having that, having the creed and the things that it says, has helped to guide me in my faith. As I became more aware of my faith life, what are these things in here? Do I really believe them? Yeah, I do. But what do they all mean? It's, it's helped me to grow in my faith. And I hope it can help us all grow in our faith. So I'm glad we're discussing the creed because it points to God. It points to Jesus. And it highlights some important beliefs at the foundation of our Christian faith. The Apostles' Creed isn't found in the Bible, so it doesn't have the authority of the Word of God, but it points to the Word of God. It points to some of the truths at the heart of the Bible. If you're unfamiliar with the Apostles' Creed, I can understand if you're apprehensive about it. Uh, since I grew up with it, I'm used to it. And, and I feel it's worth discussion. Uh, but I'll admit, I, I can be biased. I mean, I, I grew up with it, so I don't know. I am used to it. In my opinion, the Apostles' Creed should not be controversial. I realize that anything related to our faith has the potential to cause disagreements. Hashtag Merry Christmas Starbucks. All right. <laughs> I realize that some groups take issue with some aspects of the creed, but... Really, the creed shouldn't be controversial. It's short and to the point. There are other creeds. There are much longer ones. If you want to have an argument about one, pick one of the longer ones. There's a lot more to pick apart. Our hope is that this series will help us understand what the Apostles' Creed says and that by the end, we will be able to acknowledge our belief in the things that the creed affirms. And if not, that's okay. Again, if you have questions, we would love to discuss it with you. The creed gives us a great starting point for discussions. In fact, the creed is a starting point. As I told you, in my faith life, the creed was kind of a starting point for me. When I was very young, I, I heard the creed and, and heard the things that it said, and, and that kind of got me started looking into some of these core beliefs in Christianity. The creed talks about God. It talks about the three components of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The creed mentions some of the important things that God has done as described in the Bible. But the creed doesn't mention what God is doing in our life today. It doesn't really explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. It touches on some parts, but it doesn't really explain it. The creed doesn't talk about worship. It doesn't mention repentance or baptism. And the Apostles' Creed doesn't talk about how we respond to these beliefs about God. But that's a good thing. Because while these beliefs may be fairly universal, our responses to them are not. 
Different people respond to them in different ways. In fact, we may respond to them in different ways at different times in our life. Sometimes we're moved to respond in one way. Sometimes we're moved to respond in another way. Okay, you believe these things. Now, what does that motivate you to do next? That's an important question. Maybe it moves you to worship. Maybe it moves you to share your beliefs and your faith with other people. Maybe it moves you to pray. Maybe it moves you to get baptized, to take whatever the next step is in your faith. If you don't agree with part of the creed or you aren't sure if you understand what it means, then maybe it would move you to study about it, to find out what is it saying here. Or I'm not sure I agree with that. Why do they believe that? Where, where does that come from? Maybe it moves you to study, to do a little research, to dig into your faith. There are lots of ways to respond. And there is always a next step towards God. There isn't just one right answer. But there is a wrong answer. And that is to respond with nothing. It doesn't move me to do anything. Remember, the creed is a set of beliefs or aims that guide someone's action. By itself, the Apostles' Creed is just words. If we really believe these things, it should guide how we act, what we do. I mean, you can say the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Well, let's take a look at James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that there is one God. Good! Even the demons believe that and shudder. <laughs> I mean, that, you can believe that, but that doesn't mean you're on the right track. Yeah. All right? It should influence how we act. All right, that's good. It should guide what we do next. That's right. I mean, keep in mind, James also wrote in chapter 2, verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action is dead. <clears throat> Beliefs that aren't reflected in the way we live aren't really alive in us. They're not doing anything. Amen. Earlier I said that the Apostles' Creed doesn't tell us what we believe. It, we can't just be, here, you believe this now. It doesn't work that way. We need to decide what we believe. But in the same way, saying these words saying the apostles creed doesn't prove you believe the things it says well i said i believe in god i'm good i'm done right no <laughs> what does it lead you to do next that will demonstrate what you really believe it shouldn't just stop with reciting it we need to examine our hearts and make sure that we believe what we say we believe, and that these beliefs are apparent in our actions and in our daily life. In that way, the Apostles' Creed gives us another starting point. As a core set of beliefs that we can regularly check ourselves against, what do we believe? Does it match with what we say we believe? So we've been going through the parts of the Apostles' Creed. So far, we've talked about God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and so this week, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Excellent work. As I said before, the Apostles' Creed shouldn't be controversial. The topic of the Holy Spirit has historically been a source of disagreements among church folk. It can be a contentious topic. And the creed does mention the Holy Spirit, so hopefully it won't spark any arguments here. Let's take a look at what it says. Let's see if it's controversial. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then it moves on to something else. Yep, I believe in the Holy Spirit. All right, well. That, <laughs> the Bible does talk about the Holy Spirit. 
it is a thing that exists, so that's pretty hard to argue with. So that's pretty non-controversial, but wait, it also mentions the Holy Spirit here. Let's take a look. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Well, the Bible says that happened as well. It, it says that. So I think we're safe. I think we should be free from any disagreements about what the creed says about the Holy Spirit. But remember, the creed is a starting point. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit a little bit. Now, the Holy Spirit is a huge topic. The Holy Spirit is God. I mean, this is a big subject. We could spend several sermons. We could spend a whole year talking about the Holy Spirit, and we'd still only scratch the surface. So I recognize, I will admit, that out of necessity, my message about the Holy Spirit today will be incomplete. But that's okay. Maybe it's just a starting point. Uh, all right. So, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a mysterious subject to many Christians. It's not very well understood because it's not often discussed in many churches. It's, it's weird. You got God the Father. Okay, I know I can understand God the Father and Jesus. I got, I got a picture of Jesus. I understand what that's talking. And then there's this other thing, the Holy Spirit. Is it a dove, a fire? Like what, where? It's, it's mysterious. It's supernatural. The church I grew up in rarely mentioned the Holy Spirit outside of the Apostles' Creed. And as a kid, I didn't know much about it. But I was interested in it because it sounded like a ghost. Some, some believers refer to it as the Holy Ghost. I didn't know what that was, but when I was a kid, Ghostbusters was a big thing, and I knew that was awesome. And so I figured there was some kind of connection here. I wanted to learn, what is that? That's, it sounds, but it's not like that at all. Praise God. All right. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. It is fully God, just as God the Father is fully God, just as Jesus is fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully God. It's not just a part of God. It's all of God present in spirit form. God is spirit. I read that somewhere. That's right. In fact, I believe it was John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. These are the words of Jesus, and I'm pretty sure he knew what he was talking about. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of God, was present from the beginning. It didn't show up at Pentecost. It didn't show up in Jesus when he appeared. Wow. It's been present from the very beginning because it is God. If we turn back to the front of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 2, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit has been God from the beginning. That's right. Amen. So, what is spirit? Well, the online dictionary is a handy thing. It told me that spirit is the non-physical part of a person. That is, the seat of emotions and character. It could also be thought of as vital energy, life force. Okay, the non-physical part of who we are, our spirit. But, okay, so we have a spirit. You have a spirit. Amen? Amen? 
You do. Let me tell you. It's the truth. You have a spirit. All right. Can anybody help me out? Point to your spirit. Uh, it's it's non-physical. We don't know. It's not a physical thing. You can't point to it. It's immaterial. And it's distinct from your soul. You have a soul. You have a spirit. They're two different things. If you want to know the difference between the soul and the spirit, that would be an excellent question for our text line. 214 Eight five six zero five five zero. Just a heads up. If you're interested, text that in. So, you have a spirit. God has a spirit. And that Holy Spirit of God is God. Just like Jesus was God, is God, and the Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 tells us, Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. That's That's awesome. So, the Holy Spirit, it's God. Think I've said that enough? The Holy Spirit is known by several different names in the Bible and several different titles. It's referred to in different ways. It's known as the Advocate, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, the spirit of adoption. It's also referred to as the seal or the earnest of our adoption. It's also called the spirit of life. But they're all referring to that same Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. It's all talking about that one thing that is God. So what does the spirit do? Everything, anything. The spirit is God. God can do anything. But the Bible tells us that there are certain specific things that the Spirit does in us and for us and in our lives. Some of those uh, can be seen in the titles that the Spirit is given. It is the comforter. It comforts us. It is the Spirit of truth. It helps remind us of the truth of Jesus Christ and the truth that we've experienced in Scripture and in our lives. It can help remind us of that. It's the advocate. It advocates for Christ in us and through us. It's the spirit of adoption. It, it is the symbol, the seal, that we have been adopted into the family of God. That's awesome. Praise God for that. Uh, In the creed, Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. As God, the Holy Spirit is able to act in our world and in our lives. It it does all these things, and then it gives us spiritual gifts. We sometimes talk about speaking in tongues. That showed up on Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. It does many different things in our lives. It gives us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, joy, and long-suffering. Yeah. Check me on that. Um, But it gives us these things. In Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah had a word for Zerubbabel that the nation of Israel, the the nation of Judah was going to come back from captivity and not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Amen. The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, does things in our lives that aren't possible for us to do, that really aren't possible in the natural We sang about it earlier, that nothing is impossible for you, God. And whenever you've experienced something that really shouldn't have been possible, that's the Holy Spirit. It's not not by us, by our strength or the strength of our will that this is going to happen. It's by God's Spirit 
in us and acting through us and in our lives. When we pray for people, when we lay hands on them and they experience healing, that's not because of our magic hands. That's God's spirit at work yeah. in us. And God acts in all of our lives to do things. This is sort of weird for me. It's not weird anymore. But uh, again, as I said, I grew up in a church that didn't talk about the Holy Spirit very much. It wasn't a big part of my faith life growing up. I didn't know a lot about it. But man, let me tell you, the Spirit works in my life. I don't know about you, but I can testify that the Spirit is active in my life. He's done impossible things for me. I told you about my button. I mean, that's just one. But when I'm getting ready to preach, I say, God, give me your words. I, help me. Because in my daily life, I'm just an engineer. I'm not supposed to have great public speaking ability. You, you may say maybe I don't. I don't know. But... To get up here in front of people and share a message of Jesus Christ, I don't know. That's not really necessarily supposed to be in my skill set. But God's called me, got me involved, and I love talking about Jesus. I may not be the great, I don't know, I'm, I'm nothing. But the Holy Spirit helps me. I wouldn't be capable of any of this. If it wasn't for God's spirit. That's why I always say, all glory to God. Yes. He makes it possible. Thank you. Jesus. The fact that I'm here is from God through the Holy Spirit working in me and in my life and helping me daily. So, the Holy Spirit does many things. One of the most important, I've kind of referred to it, it indwells us. It lives in us. Let's take a look at John chapter 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father. Again, this is Jesus talking. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. This is talking about the Holy Spirit. In fact, verse 17, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So, again, spirit is immaterial. It's non-physical. So it can occupy the same space as we do. It lives in us. It becomes a part of us. You have a spirit, and God gives you his spirit forever. It says, and that's something new. That's kind of a new thing. In the Old Testament, it talked about the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God would rest upon people. Samson's one that comes to mind. He wasn't always a great guy, but from time to time, the Spirit of God would rest upon him and empower him to do incredible things. Well, right now my coat is resting upon me. It's not in me. It's not a part of me. That's right. Well, since Jesus, it has lived in people. He was the first. He had God's spirit in him. And he gives us that spirit. He makes it available to us. It's a gift. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Jesus said, if then, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? It's freely given. This is an incredible thing. Yes, Jesus. I mean, this is invaluable, and he will give it to us if we seek, if we ask. So the Spirit of God dwells in us. It lives in us, but doesn't control us. It guides us. We can pay attention to it, but sometimes what we should do and what we actually do are two different things. So 
It doesn't control us. It doesn't take us over and we become Holy Spirit robots. But it lovingly works in us and in our lives to help us become better, to help us grow in our faith and move closer to God if we pay attention to the Spirit, if we try to be in tune with it and, and listen. The Holy Spirit does another thing. The Holy Spirit unites us. In the first week of this series, Chris told us how the Apostles' Creed unites us by reminding us of beliefs that we share with our fellow Christians around the world and throughout history. When we recite the creed, we are affirming our beliefs with the same words that our brothers and sisters in Christ have used for centuries. Well, even more so, we are united by the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we are united with God because we are sharing his spirit. And we become a part of the family of God. And we are united with our brothers and sisters in Christ because we share the same spirit. The same spirit is living in us. After Peter's sermon in Acts 2, the people ask, well, what then shall we do? Acts 2.38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That's you. That's us. This gift of the Holy Spirit isn't just for the people who were present at Pentecost or just for them and their immediate children. It's for all who the Lord our God will call. It's for you. You can have this same spirit living in you as our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. This same spirit dwells in all who have received it. So let's take another look at the Apostles' Creed. The things mentioned after the Holy Spirit aren't just thrown in at random. So it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and it goes on from there. So again, the Catholic Church is the universal church, the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. I believe in one universal Christian church. Chris may talk more about these subjects next week, but they are related to the Holy Spirit. When did the Christian church start? When was the birth of the church? At Pentecost. And what showed up at Pentecost? In a big way. The Holy Spirit. It fell, and they were speaking in tongues. They, the Holy Spirit was very active and moving through people. That's what birthed the church. Well, I believe in this church born out of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The Holy Spirit unites us as a universal church. It is something we share that lives in us and is part of us. So... It's not just random to throw that in after the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes that possible. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There is one body of Christ. That's the church. And there is one spirit. That is the spirit of God that lives in the body. All right, well, let's take a look at that other, that next point, the communion of the saints. What does communion mean? It has a meaning in our Christian faith life, a religious meaning of sharing consecrated elements of bread and wine. But apart from this, communion means the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially 
when the exchange is mental or on a mental or spiritual level. Sharing of thoughts and feelings on a spiritual level, that's the Holy Spirit. It allows us to have communion with all the saints, all the saints around the world, our fellow believers in Christ, and all the saints who have passed on. We have communion with them. We are in a united spirit with them of loving God because of this same spirit that lives in us. The word communion is related to community. This spirit binds us together in a life, a faith life, a community where we care for one another and help one another. This spirit allows the communion of the saints. Finally, like the Apostles' Creed, the Holy Spirit guides us. Again, back at the beginning, a creed is something that, it's a set of beliefs or aims that guides someone's actions. Well, the Apostles' Creed is a starting point. The Holy Spirit guides us into the next step in our faith. The Holy Spirit shows us what, where to go next. Sometimes it can be kind of surprising when you ask God, well, where do I go from here? He might have an answer that surprises you, but that Spirit will guide you toward God. The Holy Spirit guides us into the next step in our faith. I, I depend on the Spirit. There's lots of times when I don't know what to do next, and there's times when it surprises me with what it calls me to do. As an example, last week I was here listening to the sermon, and God moved in me to ask to preach to you today and share this message. And so I did. Pastor Chris was gracious enough to let me speak to you today. I don't really know exactly why. I'm really glad to be able to share this message with you. I'm glad to be able to be up here and, and share this message. But I trust God moved me here for a reason. Something in this message was for someone here today or someone that's going to receive it. I trust in God. So... At times, the Spirit will move us, and we need to be paying attention to it. We need to listen. When it's trying to guide us, let me tell you, that's the way to go. And again, there's always a next step. There's always something to do next when it comes to our faith. So I want to ask you, what is your next step? What is your next step? Again, nothing isn't an acceptable answer. None of us are complete in our faith yet. There's always somewhere else to go, something else to do. So what is that next step for you? That's something that you have to answer. In a minute, we're going to gather up here at the front and talk to God. That's a physical step you can take. You can step out from where you're sitting and, and come gather here at the front. We're going to pray together. In fact, you can start coming right now. But what is that next step for you in your faith? If you haven't been baptized, if that's something you're interested in, you believe in Christ, but you just haven't been baptized yet, maybe that's the next step for you to take. Maybe you haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. We've been talking about it today, but you haven't experienced that in your heart. Well, you can ask him for that. What is the next step for you? Where do you go from here? I don't have the answer, but God does. And so I encourage you to come, gather and talk to him today. Ask him, what is that next step? Ask him to receive that Holy Spirit or to renew it within you. I have received God's Holy Spirit. I have experienced that, but I need it renewed frequently. I, I need his spirit living in me. I got to be refreshed from time to time. So what is it for you? What do you need today? 
Nothing is impossible for God. But we have to be 